first and foremost, I know we watch Dr. K here. We like his work. He is a person, right? So he's not a perfect person, but who is? But I think, again, I'm never preaching perfection on this channel. None of us are perfect. Not you, me, not your mom, okay? Talked to her last night. Absolutely not a perfect woman, let me tell you. Sweet, but not perfect. And in this video, one of you sent it to me with a timestamp of Dr. K and his wife having a moment on stream. I didn't know what to title this video, like having a moment. I don't mean to make it sound bigger than it is, but I don't want to, like, it's interesting. It's a communication thing. The one thing I want to say ahead of time is that they have been drinking. I think they have glasses of wine with them. And so that's playing into it. This is about an hour, uh, uh, let's see, this is about an hour into their stream. With that said, let's see how they handle this moment of tension. My girlfriend is incredibly emotionally intelligent and also very on top of her responsibilities and habits is someone who is behind in these regards. How can I feel less like the weak link in our relationship? I'm working on developing these traits, but in the meantime, I feel like I'm dragging the relationship down despite her telling me that I'm doing fine as long as I'm still working on myself. Don't compare yourself to each other. That's a bad, that's a bad way to go. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, I agree, right? So like Kruthi and I had a similar period where she was like earning in a functional human being and I was like struggling to get into medical school. And and I think that Okay. I knew you were going to be there. Hold on, I want to rewind it just for a moment. Functional human being and I was like struggling to get into medical school. And and I think that Okay. I knew you were going to be there. Um yeah, so but I I think that, that so that's what you know, right? And that's exactly what his girlfriend is telling him, right? So you're saying basically this sentence. I feel like I'm dragging the relationship down despite her telling me that I'm doing fine as long as I'm working on myself. Listen to her. Yeah, so I think the perspective, this person is asking for my perspective because I've been closer to that situation than you have. Tell him to listen to her. <laughs> no, I mean, that's not sufficient. Go ahead. Um, so... I'm a little bit. So um, you guys are asking me, what did she say? I couldn't hear it either. I think she purposely moved away from the mic so we wouldn't hear it. So I didn't hear it any more than you heard it. I can't hear what they're saying either. Concerned with how disrespectful you are to me on stream. Oh, let's okay. rewind that though. Tell him to listen to her. <laughs> no, I mean, that's not sufficient. Go ahead. Um, so... I'm a little bit concerned with how disrespectful you are to me on stream. Okay. What do you think about that? I'm serious. Um, okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Tell me more. So like when you say go ahead, it implies that you're giving me permission to speak. Oh, that's because we were both talking and then the same. You can talk. Like, you can and, talk. Right. And I will stop talking. So when you say like you can talk, that implies permission. What should I say? Um, I think maybe you should, if, yeah, I, th I think it should be a little bit more like if I'm speaking, you should ask me if you want to interrupt to begin with. Okay. Right. Instead yeah. of just got me. I got you. We good? We're good. Okay. Um, so just thinking about that for a second. So like I think you know that person is not gonna feel confident because and that's okay. And I think like we were in that same situation and Kruthi felt confident in me. And I think Kruthi was spot on that comparison is not healthy in relationship. The whole point of a relationship is not that you guys are in the same space, right? Like you're, y'all are each going to grow at your own pace. And if she supports you, listen to her. <laughs> I agree. Listen to her. Okay. What do you think about us having that little exchange on, on Twitch? I think it freaks the kids out when mom and dad fight. Yeah. yeah. So I think that um, 
I was thinking about whether I wanted to say that or not, and then ultimately decided since that's actually how we do communicate, I yeah. think it's fine to yeah. let people know you're feeling a certain way. Yeah, I agree. Don't be scared. It's fine. I think, I think telling each other in the moment is way better than being like... Than stewing. Four hours ago, you did this and, and that. And hurt my yeah. feelings. Don't do that. Right? So like if, some, if, if, if someone does something that bothers you, you let them know then and there, even if it's awkward and it scares the children a little bit. And it can feel awkward for both of us, but now we're fine. We're good. And then we talk about it. We feel better. Is it okay if I go like this when you say, let's just think for a second? Sure. Okay. You can continue to mock me. I just felt slightly disrespected. And maybe it's because Twitch chat was calling you, was calling me a beta cuck. Y'all, come on. No, it's okay. It, I mean, they can call me a beta cuck. I it's just, if I feel means. disrespected, then I'll tell you. What does that mean exactly? A beta It basically like they're saying I'm whipped. Okay. Right, so. Okay. Am I whipped? What do you think? I don't think that's a thing. I don't okay. think, I don't think a given, I mean, that's the thing. Like sometimes you're gonna be more dominant and I'm gonna back down. Sometimes I'm gonna be more dominant and you back down, right? Like it's never always equal. Okay. Um, let's do one more and then move to Twitter. Why just one more? Or whatever, whatever. I mean, we have a bunch of questions, but. Yeah. Um, so there's another Asian one with traditional family values. Okay. Uh, so hello, Dr. K and Mrs. K. Um, okay. So we're going to stop it there for a minute. Okay. So for context, three years ago, they do look like they're drinking something and it's an hour into stream. So that's like a lot of it, like a lot of reasoning. Like, again, Having a moment isn't bad. It's just a moment. So there's a little bit of tension. They're communicating. They're, there were some feelings that were hurt. And then, of course, the tension is rising and chat can feel it. We can feel it. They can feel it. And the question is, should we talk about it now and just acknowledge it instead of pretending it didn't happen? Or, you know, what should we do? And I think that often it's really nice for an audience to see that there's always going to be a little bit of tension when there's miscommunication because we're humans and we have feelings. And sometimes when the people closest to us, we have a miscommunication with them, it can feel even more like, oh my gosh, what is this? What's happening? I think that's really, really common because again, we're not just people in vats. We're people with histories. We're people with trauma. We're people with worries and fears. And in this case, people with a little bit of alcohol in their system, most likely. I assume that's what's in those glasses. I could be wrong. It could be soda. I don't know. But just based off of the context, I think this is probably like a really common and relatively normal tense moment when having like a slight miscommunication with a partner. Now, I'm not, I'm kind of surprised to use the word disrespectful because I thought what she was being was not disrespectful, but I thought she was being dismissive. So I, I do agree her personality type is dismissive, which I actually am not opposed to because I get it. Like she knows why she's saying what she's saying. And then his personality type, especially given his job, is much more slow and trying to get to where the person is and trying to see it from their perspective. And she's not in that moment. Maybe it's the alcohol. Maybe it's the fact that they're an hour into stream. Maybe she's tired. Maybe he's tired. When she hears the initial question, you know, how do I not feel inadequate in my own relationship? She's like, listen to your partner. But of course, also her partner needs, sorry, his partner needs to listen to her as well. Meaning the boy or the man who feels inadequate also needs to be heard as well. So I, I think it was just like a little moment of tension where they fell perfectly into the trope of the couple asking for advice. So almost perfectly mirrored to the audience was the tension that happens in a lot of these relationships where the woman, let's say, is a little bit more ahead and the man is harboring some sort of gendered inadequacy that he feels because the bubble has told him that men are supposed to sort of be this way and he's not living up to that standard. And even though his wife or his girlfriend is saying like, you're fine, just like make sure you're making an effort, he's still feeling the guilt from the bubble or maybe the shame from the bubble, I should say. 
And so in this very moment, it's almost like Dr. K and his wife perfectly mirrored that where she was like, just listen to her. And he was like, yeah, but like, what about this? And so it's kind of like beautiful, actually, that they could share this moment on stream a bit and let us see how it end up it ends up being kind of an internal issue. So when I say like, listen to your partner, I don't mean to follow it with an action. I mean, be an active listener. So I will say what one thing she didn't do in this moment is actively listen. I think she was actually struggling to listen and care about the boy who was asking the question. And then Dr. K used the word disrespectful, but I think he should have said dismissive because that's how I would have categorized it. But maybe in his mind, the the dismissiveness is disrespectful. So then I could see that perspective as well. And then even the way she reacted back to him to just be like, oh, okay, like, sure, keep talking. Yeah, it, it, she wasn't being very warm. She wasn't being very active listener. But also that doesn't make her a bad person. Nothing about this was toxic. Everything about this was just like tensions arise when there's miscommunication. Now we just have to try to be an active listener. They're both aware Lots of people are watching. Lots of people are commenting. They're looking at the chat. There's there's going to be a feeling of defensiveness. You know what I mean? So again, I, I don't think anything about this was like toxic. I think everything about this was just like, oh yeah, look at that. A little bit of tension when there's some miscommunication. You know what I mean? Um, Ooh, great point. General says, I thought dismissal was just a form of disrespect. I could, yes, for sure. Like, I think that's a valid perspective. I think my brain latches on to more like, I don't, I don't know, like dis disrespect to me could, feels like a much like a bigger word than necessary. But yeah, sure. Obviously a level of disrespect. I agree with that. I just wouldn't use it in my language, but I could see why he would use it in his. So valid, right? Yeah. Um. Okay, then... Now check this out. So I was curious. So this question is for I was curious about the vibe in general. So I went back to the first 20 minutes of the episode, right? In the first 20 minutes of the episode, I wanted I wanted to see if she had the same personality type because I haven't seen much content from her, right? He's the content creator. So check this out, right? And I don't know what she does for a living. So keep in mind he actually does do this for a living versus she, I don't I don't know what she does. So look at this and see how the personality types are differing even here. This is 20 minutes in and the question is highlighted as dating and low self-worth. For example, your parents think they are not successful. I've heard this. See, it's cool that we That's... addressed all that without. I read it. <laughs> okay. How do you approach dating someone who lacks self-worth? Don't do it. So she says right away, she's very, I, I understand this personality type. You could even argue she and I are probably pretty similar. Though, of course, I tend, I like to think of myself as both Dr. K and her because I try to meet people where they're at, but I'm also like, don't do it. So like right away, the first, like she has the answer already and I'm going to trust her to have a reason for that answer. So I found that like relatable, but when you're talking to the internet, um, you know, it's like any, I see this in a lot of like more. Like Sprinkle Sprinkle does this too. I'm not a fan of Sprinkle Sprinkle's philosophy on life, but she does that. She answers right away. Leave him. Don't get a job. Sprinkle Sprinkle. Like certain dominant personalities, especially in women, right away we're like, do this. Actually, men do it too. There's a category of like personality where like, just do it. Don't do it. Because they've already thought about it. This isn't the first time they're hearing the question. So right away the question, right? Listen to it again. Top one. I did the second one. Okay. Um... Oh, see, like this is exactly like this. So this question is, for example, your parents think they are not successful. I've heard this. See, it's cool that we That's... addressed all that without. I read it. <laughs> okay. How do you approach dating someone who lacks self-worth? Don't do it. Don't do it. Right away. She's like, don't do it. Not even a pause because she's already thought about it. Like sometimes the questions I get on stream, people have to understand, I've already answered them like thousands of times. So I already have the answer in my head. I already know why I came to this conclusion. It's not like I'm answering them because I haven't thought about them. All I do is ponder, I, <laughs> you know? So obviously I assume she's thought about this before. So look at the answer as they have the conversation moving forward. Don't do it. Dude, you realize you're dooming all of our audience to be single for the rest of their lives if they're not willing to date people who are who lack self-worth no <laughs> no just get this fix the self-worth and then go to dating so you so right away she's just like don't date somebody with low self-worth because they're not ready to be a good partner and he's like yeah you're telling our whole audience like they're not gonna date anyone because they 
can't date anyone with self-worth issues. So the thing is, is he's talking to a very specific audience and she's just giving her opinion. Do you see the difference? Like he knows who's watching and she's just giving her opinion. And that's often like that. I agree with her. But also this is literally so relatable right now, considering we just had this whole arc of like Brittany explaining her language type. I am like this woman. I'm just giving you an opinion. I'm not really thinking about who's watching me because I assume it's a diverse community because that's what my statistics and analytics show. But if you'd like me to talk to a certain group of people, I'm going to choose successful women with dominant personalities. Okay. But like, okay, don't make me pick my audience. Don't make me like choose an audience to talk to. But see how Dr. K has to do that because it's his brand. And look, if I'm going to pick anybody, you know, to focus in on my audience, I said what I said. But Dr. K knows who he's talking to and she's just giving her opinion separate from the audience. That's the difference, right? You're saying engage with them and help them with their self-worth or you're saying? No. I'm saying <laughs> like, aren't alcoholics not supposed to date other alcoholics? Like recovering alcoholics? Codependency? Like stay sober together? Sure. I feel like self-worth, like can be a bad codependent thing. I agree with this. Yeah. And Ingrid, great point, says a trained professional versus a normal person. Exactly. Exactly. Right? I don't have like, I agree with this. I think if you're deeply, deeply struggling with a deep wound, your partner can't be there to fill that wound. I don't think it works. Like money's not going to fill that wound. A partner's not going to fill that wound. But I don't think you have to wait until you're perfect to date anyone because, hey, newsflash, you'll never be perfect. You'll never be perfect, kids. So it's not about being perfect, but man, don't you want to be healthy enough that you're not going to destroy your partner's life because you haven't figured your shit out? I think it's inherently cruel to date somebody when you know you're going to fail them as a partner because you can't even stop failing yourself. Now, of course, a lot of us have internalized trauma and issues. So when you hear me say that, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, like, you know, I'm a B plus student, but I really want to be an A plus student. And because I'm a B plus student, I guess that means I can't date. It's like, make sure you know what we're talking about. Make sure you're not hearing me talk and internalizing it as the wrong message because we're speaking different languages. Obviously, she's saying something very specific and they have to have the conversation to clarify what it is. But I agree that generally speaking, if you are a deeply wounded person and you're struggling, dating is not what's recommended. And so I think that that's something that is kind of missed in the conversation because people people who are basically functional and pretty great people literally doubt themselves. And I'm like, you're not in, we're not talking about you. We're talking about a very specific kind of person. See how she brings up alcoholics? Often, not always, I've never been an addict, but from the, what I've understood from the people in my life who have told me, they do not recommend dating out of AA, right? So you know what I mean? James says, pretty much most people don't have their shit 100% figured out. It's an unrealistic expectation. You don't need to have your shit figured out 100%, but you have to have the big stuff figured out. You have to. In my opinion, in my opinion, you have to have the big stuff, the stuff that's going to ruin the relationship, the thing that's going to make you a bad parent, the thing that's going to fuck the people around you over. You, sh you should have that figured out before you get into a relationship, in my opinion. Now, of course, this is also speaking from a place assuming you haven't been in a relationship or aren't in a relationship, right? I did that. My partner did that. Uh, a lot of people in my life did that. You handle the big stuff, the stuff that is going to end, make or break the relationship, right? So if you're struggling with, you know, something and that something is literally a pattern in your life that ruins everything you do and you don't have it under control, it's kind of, I think, unethical to ask someone to consent to that relationship, but also it's within their right to consent to it all the same as well, right? If you're super, super like confident in who you are and stuff, then maybe, but I don't know. I think... I think if people are really struggling with self-worth, it's not the right time to engage with a relationship. You don't think I was struggling with self-worth when we met? No, you had just done your monk thing. Exactly. I agree with her. He wasn't struggling with self-worth in the same way. So again, a person who's struggling with self-worth in the way that we mean, I think in the way that she's trying to say, is somebody who's not applying 300 times to medical school. Dr. K at this time in his life was applying to over 300 places for medical school and got rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected. That is not a person with low self-worth. That is a person with some self-worth issues, 
But when I say low self-worth, I mean somebody who cannot even like, who couldn't even do that, right? I've met people with depression who still manage to pay the bills. It's not that you can never struggle. It's to make sure that your struggle isn't keeping you from your commitments. And if it's going to keep you from your commitments, making sure you let people know that, right? So people with low, low self-worth, the way that she's trying to say it and the way that I'm thinking about it too, isn't people that are still functioning. It's people that are not functioning versus people who are struggling. Struggling is life. I struggle because of my fibro, but my fibro isn't going to be the reason that I don't pay the rent because I will never let it be. But for some people, they get diagnosed with fibro and completely give up on their life, give up on their children. This is what my doctor told me. And this is what I guess like happens a lot of the time is people get fibromyalgia and they just like give up. And I've heard some people tell me this as well. And so I told myself, okay, I don't wanna be in that category of person, so I'm gonna do it anyways. I'm not gonna do it perfectly. My body's not the same, but my fibro will never be the reason. I Like I'm never gonna give up on my life because I have fibro. Right. So like, that's my opinion. That's the decision I've made. Yes, maiden, suffer wisely. Exactly. So let's continue. I was like, I don't care about self-worth anymore. What about the years and years that I didn't get into medical school and had no, no job, no value? Didn't but I already knew you then. We were already like. And also him saying he had no value because he had no job. I don't think that's true. I don't think having a job equals value. If you believe having a job equals value, then that's your own personal values. I don't think having a job is what makes a person valuable, you know? So again, when we have this conversation, we have to understand we're projecting our own values onto the conversation. I don't think, you know, um, I don't think Dr. K is the category of person that quote had no value just because he didn't have a job. But some people who don't have jobs are people who are refusing to engage or contribute to the commitment they've made, which makes them sort of like useless in quotation marks. But of course, those are different categories. Two people who are both jobless does not mean they're the same category. Like we were already committed to each other. I wouldn't. Yeah, Lexi says, I don't believe he thinks that either. I think he's saying it for his audience's sake. I think he's saying it to be relatable, relatable to his audience. I don't think he knows. He's, excuse me. He's a he's an incredibly educated person who lived an incredibly challenging life. He's an exceptional person. He's a top one percenter, like real, like in terms of um, accomplishments, like realistically. Okay. You don't get there. I think he's just trying to relate to his audience. I didn't have started a relationship with you in that state. <laughs> oh, get them, get them before they're not you. <laughs> no, 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 but failure is different. Failure and self-worth are different. <laughs> Remember, because you're like, I could apply to Caribbean schools, but I'm better than that. You had self-worth. I did have self-worth. That's fair. True. True. There, This this kind of goes back. She's referencing there was a time. So after my second year of not getting into med school. Sorry, Kay says, yeah, he definitely doesn't believe that. He's just letting his wife speak so the audience gets the POV from another mouth and he's asking on their behalf. I agree with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Savory says that's such a bubble thing. I didn't have a job for years and there was no shortage of people who saw my value in other aspects. It's not shameful to me. People try to, like, yeah, people try to use that against you. Like, oh my gosh, you don't have a job. And don't get me wrong. It depends on the bubble and the expectation. But yeah, like having a job is not where your worth is formed. Unless it, unless it is, right? Unless it is, like, unless it is. This is very complicated, right? If you're dating somebody or you're in a relationship with somebody who's not doing anything, who's just sitting on the couch all day and literally not helping at all, making your day worse, making messes and leaving it for you to clean up, literally like ruining your life, well then maybe they need a job, but also maybe they need a whole revamp of their values, you know? Um, I, I thought about, you know, alternate career options and decided to be bullheaded and and not deviate from the goal that I had set for myself, which I guess means that I had set self-worth. I mean, I, I wouldn't quite agree that you shouldn't not date people without self-worth because then I think... No, I'm not saying don't date people without self-worth. I'm saying I don't start a relationship from that space. Like you can... I think it's more important to pull out of there. What do you mean by self-worth? That's the problem. Because a lot of these people got codependent savior complexes and I don't want no white knight girl. So that's the dilemma too, right? Like the dilemma is that if you have no self-worth, like what am I supposed to do with that person? That person needs therapy. That person needs meditation. That person needs a lot of work, 
right? And that person's not even doing it for themselves. Like I'm certainly not going to come out of the woodwork and like white knight you. And look, no offense. I'm not into those codependent relationships where somebody comes in and picks you up and like somehow makes your life all the way better. Because also I swear after recovery, half those people don't even stay together because you outgrow your partner. So I don't know what you mean by low self-worth or no self-worth, but I'm assuming that means you don't even like like yourself to such an extent that you're not even functional or able to be in a relationship with anyone anyways. So it sounds weird that we're always telling people like date somebody who respects you, but does not start with respecting themselves. Like you don't even respect yourself enough to have self-worth. And then you want to commit to somebody and say, will you, will you love me? Because I don't even love me. No, I don't think that's within reason. I don't think that's fair, but that's my opinion and you don't have to share it. Right. What do you mean by self-worth? I think you might be using a different definition than he is because I don't think he's lying. Your audience is just talking about something different. Well, when she says low self-worth or no self-worth, I mean, that's saying you have like no value internally in relation to yourself, right? So you can have a spectrum of low self-worth or high self-worth, but I don't even understand the idea. They just said the words no self-worth as well right? So does that mean zero relationship with the self? Like you don't value anything about yourself. You have no good relationship with yourself. You don't like yourself. You don't see the value in yourself in any capacity. Isn't that what the, what they would mean by no self-worth, which is why she's saying don't date somebody from that perspective. Like what, what are you building on? Right? Like what are you building on? And if he's saying I had low self-worth, yeah. Did he have some doubts? Did he have some, everybody has doubts guys. Doubts is not low self-worth. That's just doubting yourself because you're not sure about something, but it's not the internalization of saying like, I am useless, I am worthless, like I'm unlovable. That's something, hello, you ever been depressed or have borderline? That's just, okay. But I, even in those moments, had some idea of worth enough to get a job and enough to move my life forward. So again, it's not about being with people with low self-worth or no self-worth. It's about being with people who have enough self-worth to keep going. Right? So I think there's a little bit of a difference here, you know? So why does it sound like a lie that he could feel those things? And also, well, he just said it was. He just said, that's true. I did have self-worth. So I was, what do you mean? He just corrected himself and said, okay, well, I did have self-worth. You're right. He just said that to his wife. So he even agrees with her assessment and with what I'm saying, right? So I'm saying it's a lie for his audience. And then he corrected himself which it's not a lie like in a bad way. He's just speaking for his audience in a good way, like a content creator, you know? James says, I have low self-worth. Does that make me a horrible, unstable person? I don't know, James. You tell me. You're the person with the low self-worth. Do you think you're a horrible, unstable person? You don't ask the internet, girl. Ask yourself. Don't seek validation from a content creator. Ask yourself. You're the only person who gets to judge you. If you think you're a horrible, unstable person, that answers the question. If you don't think you're that, then why would you think you're that? Right? Okay? No, we're not. I'm not. Anytime you ask me, what does that mean? I'm not. No, no, I I literally don't understand what what we. So so not start a relationship from that space. Like, I don't know what that means. Does that mean not date them? Like, what is the difference between dating someone and not starting a relationship from that space? Ooh, see, right away before the answer, I would say dating people is different than starting a relationship with someone. You can date people without starting a relationship with them. You're dating them to get to know yourself and them. You're going on first dates. You're having like a, like you're gathering tools, but then saying, will you be my partner? Will you be associated with me? Will you be my boyfriend, girlfriend? That sounds like starting a relationship versus dating doesn't to me. Like I'm I'm just doing the same thing. So don't date them. Don't start dating them. If they have low self-worth. Right. If you're already dating them, like, don't just bail on them. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I, I agree with that because I think that, like, you know, I think that's one of the big problems is to, like, if you're looking for, and I, I realize this isn't what you're saying, but I'm going to just extend it. God. Right. It, like, if you're looking for a perfect partner, and I, I know that's not what you're saying, but I think a lot of people struggle with self-worth, and I think that a lot of the way that, you know, when I've seen people who have gained self-worth, a lot of times it's through a stable relationship. Okay. And I think that if, if there's someone who doesn't have good self-worth, then it's not. So here's what I would say. First of all, it's not that you shouldn't date them. I, I think the reason that you should date them is because you find them engaging. You enjoy spending time with them. You find them attractive in some way. 
you um, you know, hopefully have some kind of future where I'm kind of presuming that you're looking for a more long-term sort of relationship and not just a temporary thing. Um, but I, I think those are the reasons and people are going to have flaws. Like sometimes they're going to be addicted to alcohol. Sometimes they're going to have low self-worth. Sometimes age are we talking about? Cause I I'm talking about more like my girlfriends that are like, you know, early thirties and for them, dude, early thirties is like, is, it is like grandpa's on Twitch. So that's the other thing as well. Age demographics. Somebody on my, somebody on a comment called me an old person and they're like, old people shouldn't have comments about things. And I was like, <laughs> Instead of learning from your elders, you're like, old people don't know what real life is. I literally got the sweetest comment. I'm not even mad about it. Like, they literally were like, old people should have comments about these things. These are real life. Like, real life is happening. Old people should go back to gardening. And I'm like, am I the old person? That is, I was shook. So obviously, when I'm saying, like, getting into serious relationships, I'm not thinking about a 21-year-old kid who's never moved out of his mom and dad's house or had a job. If you're talking about dating people, you better be casually dating or you better be old enough to have a serious relationship with someone or ready enough to have one. So that's the problem, too. She's probably thinking of people who are more established. Like if you're looking for marriage, we have to assume you're like ready to be married, which is a very big deal, which is, you know what I mean? Like being ready for marriage was supposed to be something you prepared for, you know, but then he's talking to a group of people that are so young on Twitch. So they're talking to two different audiences, which is even funnier. Yeah, so that's why I'm asking. If it's like so, in your 20s, early 20s or college, like I think that's just the state of life at that point in time. So I wouldn't worry about it as much. I'm reacting more. Yeah, so I think if you're of, if you're 30. Yeah. Anyway, so I th I think good point that it depends on where you are like in in your life and how you are. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um <laughs> that's that's what, that's what I'm saying. Like I, I don't think you understand who we're talking to. I <laughs> See how she like he's like you don't know who we're talking to right now. He's talking to a specific demographic, and she's just sharing her opinion, which I think is so specific. Same with guys. This is so relatable to me right now. This is so relatable. If you want me to start paying attention to who I think is watching me, I can start curtailing my language, but you know that's going to alienate a whole group of people. Like Dr. K, he's not talking to women in their 30s. He's talking to boys on Twitch. Like it's a very specific demographic. So he's like, oh my God. So like her advice, though I agree with it because I'm a woman in my 30s. <laughs> obviously the Twitch boys aren't going to get it. I said, you know, Sneeko said that to me one time I was doing a collab with Sneeko and he's like, Brittany, you're talking to like, you're my audience is teenage boys. You're not going to like, you're going way over their head right now. And I was like, Oh, like I'm just talking. Cause I'm not thinking about who the audience is. I'm just talking from my perspective, but obviously Sneeko's like, girl, like you're going, you're talking so above, like you got to like bring it down to teenage boy level. And I was like, Oh, um, <laughs> What's up, bros? Listen here, bros. <laughs> like, you know, you just don't know who the audience is, which is kind of funny. I don't. How old are you guys? Can y'all just chat your ages? Ooh, I want to know too. 25, 12, 17. There's really 12 year olds that are watching this? What? I, I don't believe. Really? And 25. Good for them. You guys watching boomerism. Right. Okay. So for the early 20s, that's what I was. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me right. let, let me go. It, it, helps, go. it helps. It helps. Okay. Okay. So like, here's here's the thing. Like, so if you have someone with low self worth, like I think you can be supportive towards them. But a couple of things to remember. The first is that you're not their therapist. Right. Right. And ultimately, their their journey towards gaining self worth is not dependent on you. Right. So you could you should support them absolutely, but you know, you're not responsible for them gaining self-worth. Ultimately, mm -hmm. like being confident in yourself as a human being comes from like in here. It doesn't come from any, like no one can make you feel good about yourself. A fucking men. Tell that 40 year old virgin what Dr. K just said. That's what I'm trying to say. See how Dr. K and her agree? He's just coming about it slowly and she already came up with the answer because she knows the answer. That's the difference between the two. He's explaining the answer. She's like, that's the answer. Right. That 40 year old virgin, very nice lady. She was she kept thinking, if I just have a romantic relationship, if I just fall in love, all of this self-loathing will go away. Sis, your partner is not your therapist. Your friends are not your therapists. Go to therapy. You're having mental health problems. You're having you're having a relationship with your consciousness problem, bro. Right. You have to learn how to do that on your own. And I think you should have reasonable expectations around that if you're their partner. At the same time, 
you know, sometimes people unfortunately live a life where no one has appreciated their value and they've never had that kind of experience. And so the reason that they have low self-worth is because no one has shown them their worth. Mm. And I think what you can take responsibility for is in like showing them their worth. Now, whether they see it or not, whether they see... One of the ways to show your kids their worth is by showing up and tucking them in at night. This comes from your family. This starts at home, right? Your family showing up and reminding you you're worthy. I love you, right? I love you enough to stay in your life. I love you enough to see you as often as possible. I love you enough. You are worth it. You're beautiful to me. I, th you know, whatever it's going to be, whatever the language is. Gracie says, why is he calling her dude? Brittany, is it normal to you? Like people calling their partners dude? I always found it kind of rude and strange when I would see others do it to their partners. I do it to my partner. My partner and I, I do that all the time to him. I do it to my mom though. My, my partner saw me making a Marco Polo for my mom and I was like, bro, 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 bro. And he's like, you call your mom, bro. I was like, I call everybody, bro. You're not better. Like you, okay. What is it? It's, I'm not insulting you, bro. So yeah, like I do, like I, I call my mom, bro. I call my friends, bro. I call my partner, bro. I call him dude. I'm like, dude, 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 dude. Listen, dude. Okay. Like I'm from Cali, bro. Okay. Listen. So I get it. Um, I don't, I think it's cute. I think it's great. You know what I mean? Cause you're best friends with your partner as well. We have some limitations with how far we take our non-romantic side, let's say, but in general, yeah, I do call my partner, bro. You know, Scuttle says, is this the first stream his wife and partner was on? I don't know, but this was three years ago. So I'm not sure. Cam Cam says I could never call my mom, bro. Nah, I call my parents, bro. I'm like, bro, because I'm not really calling them, bro. I'm just saying bro is like a, like a filler. I don't know if you guys know. I'm not like when I call my partner, bro, when I call anybody, bro, I'm not really calling them, bro. I'm just filling in the silence with the word to make it casual. You know, like, girl, listen, girl, 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 girl. I'm not actually calling you a girl. I'm just like, call, I'm like, girl, listen, girl. I'm not literally calling you a girl, right? It's just language you use to bring out the casual and to like say like we're friends, we're homies, like we're having a combo, you know? So it's just like you're filling in the space. I don't know if people like, I'm not a girl. I'm like, I know you're not a girl. What are you fucking dumb? I know you're not a girl. You think I'm that fucking stupid? Yeah, yeah. Ken says bro equal hey you. Exactly. Bro. Not bro as in brother. Well, <laughs> brother. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> okay. Do you, don't you love like they're having this conversation, who your audiences matters, how you talk matters? That you appreciate them, whether they let that, that respect in and let it change them is on them. But for you to treat them with respect and, and kind of be patient and also like, you know, so you, you can kind of create a supportive environment. But I think, you know, a couple months in, if their self-worth isn't changing at all, I think it's reasonable to have a conversation with them about, look, I think you're an awesome person and I don't know how to convince you of that more than I have been. And I really think you need to like think long and hard about you're why. Glorified. Let's just think about that for a second. That's what you're going to do. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I always do. <laughs> okay, no, here's, here, what is the <laughs> Can point? I finish? No, because you're going to end with, let's just think about it for a second. Well, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, go for it. All right, so. I, you what's ruined the, my rhythm. I did. And you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, the point of a relationship, in, in my I, point of view, is to be something better together. And if one person is just pulling somebody else up, that is not both of you going up, right? So if the low self-worth thing is just one person always pulling up the other person, that is not a good relationship. Mm. You guys both have to go up together. If like one person's starting here and one person's starting here and you're both going up, that's fine. But that's, that's how I think about it. I, I was actually going to get there. Yeah. So I, I think like, you know. Uh, My way was better though, right? Sure. sure. To yeah. To the point. It, it is shorter. Hand gestures. Um, and so I, I was just going to say that, you know, you can do your part. And then like at some point you have to really have a conversation with them about are they doing their part? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day. Like I said, my partner and I both have our own unique 
journeys. We're both solo journey people who are doing life together now. And we both have our unique upbringings and lifestyles and issues. And we both work on our own things. We're responsible for our own responsibilities. And we don't make our problems each other's problems, but we are each other's biggest cheerleaders, right? So if I go to my partner and say, hey, I really need to go to therapy. I think that'd be really good to go to a doctor or somebody who can help me. His job is to be my cheerleader. His job is not to tell me, you don't need that. You don't need a medical professional. You have Jesus Christ, <laughs> you know, like that's not what he's going to do. Obviously, we're not religious, but his job is to be my cheerleader and say like, yeah, you should definitely get help because like that's the best part about life is like you can pay someone to help you. So like you should do that, right? And if I go to, if he comes to me and says like, hey, I want to work on this thing, my job is to support him in working in, on, on this thing. But what our job isn't to do is to do the work for them. It's not his job to be my therapist. I need to go to therapy, right? If it's not his job to go to the gym for me, I have to go to the gym. It's not his job to do anything. He doesn't, he can't work on my fibro for me. I have to work on my fibro. Like he can't do it for me, you know? So I think sometimes in relationships, the ones that I think that are more toxic or codependent is there's this idea that like, who needs a therapist when I have a best friend? Who needs a therapist when I have a boyfriend? Who needs a therapist when I'm like, ma'am, go to therapy. Like your friends are not your therapists. You know, your partners are not your therapists. Your friends are not your MDs. Go to a doctor. You can't be responsible for bringing them up. And I, I completely agree with what you said about, you know, the whole point of a relationship is that the two of you together are better than either of you on your own. And that like a good relationship allows you to like grow and change over time. Mm -hmm. And ultimately you don't end up being married to the person that you started dating or even married. Yeah. My partner and I were just saying this earlier. Like we, I cannot wait to know who we will be in our forties. I'm just so excited to meet my future partner in his 40s. Like, who will he be? What will he be like? And same, like, I can't wait to meet myself in my 40s. But like, I didn't go on this introspective journey to stay the same girl. I went on this introspective journey to accept and not hold on to this version of myself. I am not attached to the version of the husband I married. He is not attached to the version of the woman he married. We are not attached to these versions. We expect the other to change. And as long as we're working as a team to change together, that, that's kind of the goal. And I think that's the hardest part. How do you change with somebody? That is really difficult. And I think that takes a high level of understanding of philosophy and a high level understanding of self, right? And I think that's the key, right? It's like, how do you change? It's like, a, it's about that Buddhist mentality of letting go of that attachment, right? And then understanding there's some practical things to mix into there. James says a therapist is only there for an hour a week. Sometimes that isn't enough. Then I think you don't know what a therapist is for. A therapist is something different than a friend listening to your problems. And if you guys do not know the difference between a therapist and a friend, that's like saying, I don't know the difference between an MD and a shaman in the woods. They are different things. And so again, they might all help you in different ways, but they are different things. And if you don't know the difference between them, I think that's the issue I'm seeing with a lot of people. A lot of people will end a YouTube video and be like, that felt like therapy. I don't know what kind of therapy you went to, but my therapy does not feel like any video I've ever seen on YouTube. I don't know why, like unless it's from a therapist, but like none of the view videos I ever watch on YouTube do I think that felt like therapy. But other people are like, yeah, this is what therapy is. I'm like, we did different therapy somehow. I did DBT, but it felt like therapy. It was so specific. I'd never done anything like it. It doesn't feel like philosophy to me. Maybe therapy is different everywhere and I know that it is. So that's just my bubble. So I'm only speaking for my bubble. But a therapist isn't there to be there more than necessary because they're only working on your mental health. Usually, philosophy is the issue. Values. Why do I exist? Why am I on the planet? What is the purpose of my life? That, finding that answer is the hardest journey because most of the time you're born into a family that tells you you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be an engineer. You're going to work at the family grocery store. You know, you're going to do this thing, Right. Stephanie says there's definitely some shitty therapists out there. Well, people are people and nobody is perfect. So don't get a shitty therapist. I had a shitty therapist. I fired her. You have so much power. I fired her and got a different therapist and that therapist saved my life. I will always be grateful that I had the strength to like fire my first therapist to get the good therapist 
because the second therapist was actually interested in helping me solve my problems, which was amazing. The first therapist was definitely just there for money, which happens, right? Even doctors are like that. Even priests are like that. If priests are diddling your children, do you think therapists can't be shitty? Come on, guys, let's do the math together. I know I'm being a little harsh, but let's do the math. If the Vatican is riddled with sex parties and diddlers, do you really think there's no such thing as a bad therapist? Come on. Come on. Yeah. Well, the other thing, so my this is something my dad told me that I think is great advice. And I, I think about it frequently in our relationship, but... This guy who says no caring. Absolutely. Keep going. Well, okay. So what my dad told me was that there's no such thing as being equals all the time, right? Like there is no, a relationship that focuses on like just equality is kind of destined to be always in a state of argument and disagreement. But over time, you're equal, right? At any point in time, one person is going to be putting more into that relationship, right? It might be me kind of moving my life for you for medical school and then you do it. What are you doing for me? Yeah. So in case in point, so I, I think the short answer is not much. No, that's not true at all. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, but I mean, so, so, you know, Gruthi and I had a conversation years ago, like when I was thinking about when I got into med school, um, you know, we were just thinking a lot about like what we want to do. So this was like when I was 25, 26. So I'd been out of college for a couple of years, no job. You know, I was doing research at Harvard. So that's something, but it hadn't really translated the way that right. we thought it would. And, and, you know, we just had a conversation about like, okay, like, you know, what are we going to do? Should I go to the Caribbean for medical school? Um, and we sort of decided no, because we would be apart. And then, you know, I was in Boston. She was in Austin, had worked for an awesome startup that got acquired and then moved to New York. So then we were kind of closer and that was actually, I, that was a great year. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, so we did like long distance from Texas to Boston for a year or two and then like long distance from New York to Boston. Mm. And then when I got into med school, cause like she had better career opportunities in New York or like on the West coast and really didn't have a whole lot of options in Boston. And so basically took a I mean, in, on paper, I guess a decent job, but frankly, a shitty job that did not help her advancement at all. Sure. Um, you know, like a mid-level executive at like a mid-level you know, company, like a company, like a boomer, a boomer company. I did you ever save their website? Like you remember their original website? I it just looked it's like some GeoCities level yeah. awfulness. <laughs> so just real, like she was a mid-level executive at like a boomer company. It was like the Dunder Mifflin of tech companies. Oh God, great way to put it. Um, so, you know, she just made a sacrifice and said like, okay, if you're going to be in med school in Boston, that's the best place for you. I'll move there so that we can be together. And then the next decision point came for residency. So frankly, I did really well in med school and, you know, was a highly sought after candidate for residency. And so we had the option to basically go wherever we wanted. Um, and then we talked a lot about, okay, so, you know, if you want to move to New York for your career, like I can definitely, you know, get, go to Columbia or something like that. Right, or and what, Stanford or what we UCLA. eventually said, right, because at, at some point you have to rank, right, in this process. And that's like where your priorities really crystallize. So mm. it was MGH1. Well, that's what I mean. Columbia 2. Yes. To come to me, right? And so we said, if you're going to do this and you're going to be the best, I will move for you. If you're not going to be the best, move for me. Mm. And I think third was like University of Hawaii. That is exactly the conversation style I have with my partner. What is our goal and what is the best outcome and who's going to be the best? I'm going to be the best in career. So we focus on my career. Who's going to be the best when it comes to everything else? Him, not me, him. So we play to our strengths. This is a beautiful fucking conversation, bros. You know, Gracie says, I don't mean like bro. I didn't really mean in general either. I'm talking about like if you're having a serious conversation with your partner or even a heated one and they call you dude. Well, I think in heated conversations, you obviously have an expectation of people meeting you where you're at. So for some people, if you need to be spoken to a certain way, I think it's nice to have those conversations with your partner and say like, when it's a serious conversation, these words make me feel like you're not paying attention to me. And again, it's up to you. Yeah, because again, when I'm, I tend to, it depends on the person. 
Because I can, I understand the shift when you're, when there's a shift in the room, when there's tension, when you're more serious, when you're having a more honest convert, like I'm not honest, but when you're having a more raw conversation, obviously you're going to use different language. You're going to talk in a different way. So I think sometimes that's a learned tool as well. It's like a tool to learn how to change tone when you notice the room has shifted, you know? Anyways, I love this conversation, right? This is like really nice. Lakar says, hmm, I feel like they interrupt each other a lot too often for my taste, but hopefully it's not an issue in their relationship. Oh, I don't think they interrupt. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, girl. <laughs> Look, I try really hard not to interrupt and stuff, but like my partner and I are both so neurodivergent. We are always interrupting. And then we're always like keeping tabs on conversations. My whole family is like this. Oh, this is, yeah, this is like, um, isn't that, that's good to know. I'm not, I don't think it's a value, like a value issue, like bad or good. I think it's fine. But like, oh, my whole family, not only do we interrupt and derail, but like two weeks later, my mom will be like, okay, so anyways, like I was saying, and she'll continue the conversation she had before like two weeks ago. And I don't even say like what she doesn't have to preface it. I already know what the convo is. And same with my husband, like we'll be in the middle of 10 conversations at once. And so it's like, it's so we're so used to it. So I didn't even notice they were really interrupting each other because I was like, oh, they're just talking. Like I didn't even notice this felt like interruption. And I fucking love that you thought it was interrupting. I love that. Hawaii. That's what I wanted you to put. <laughs> Then if you're not going to be the best, you're not going to be able to move for me. Let's just go have a good it, time. It's just, to, I think, to kind of echo Ruthie's point of like, if you're going to be equal at each step of the way, neither of you is going to be get what you, you right. know, really achieve. And right. it, I think it's fine. And you know, I used to have this dream. I used to have this dream of like, I'm going to date someone just as like motivated career wise as I am. And then I realized like, oh, I will never be happy with somebody who's as dedicated to their career as I am. Because what, like it won't, it wouldn't make sense, right? And I've seen this with a lot of couples who do this and I think it's really impressive, but I don't want to live away from my partner. He doesn't want to live away from me. We don't want to have to separate and we don't want to have to live in New York and Boston in two different places. Like we don't want to do that. So for us, it makes so much more sense for us to focus on one person's career and make sure that person is the best they can be and they're making enough money for two people than to have two people working and both focus on a career that will take us away from one another. I was in um I was in a group with like really successful women. And one of the complaints of one of the women who was childless was that her and her partner, her husband of like 10 years, were really both successful people. But both of their industries weren't complementary. So like she works days, he works nights, he works weekends. And so they never saw each other. And I was like, ooh, I don't want this. Like I don't want two of us in a relationship that are very, very in love with our careers, I realized that um, even my mom is like a supportive role to my dad. My mom works for my dad. She supports his business and they focus on that business. And even though my mom makes her own money through the company, of course, like she's an employee, she focuses on making this business work because it just makes more sense. And it's kind of like my dream was always to find a partner who could support my career and not feel threatened by it. And I think that that would become a big issue. Now, that's, I'm, again, I'm not moralizing it. I'm just letting you know that's why we fall into this category. Because for us, we want to make the team win. And I am much more in love with a career. You know what I mean? Than, than he would be. But also, I look at this woman that I saw years ago. And I saw how miserable she was 10 years into her marriage. That she was thinking about divorcing her husband because they never saw each other. And I was like, ooh. I get that. I don't want to live in a life where I don't see my partner all the time. So again, I think that's important, right? And also like we pick and choose our our life based off of the opportunities in front of us, right? So it's kind of interesting. I also love how some of you saw that as too much interrupting and some of you didn't see it as interrupting at all. And I love that. That is so telling to know what category you're in, right? Aaliyah says, I don't think they're interrupting. I think they're bouncing off ideas off of each other. I love that, right? Like for some people, they're bouncing ideas off of each other, which is what I see. And for other people, it's like too much interrupting. And I think that's beautiful, right? Knowing which one you are, knowing what the vibe is. Like my partner and I, we're always like, and I love that both of us are thinking about our own ideas and comparing them. Like we're two very different people, 
but we come to similar conclusions, but from different perspectives. And it's really cool. I'm like, how did you get there? Tell me how your brain worked. And he'll be like, well, I thought of this. And so I thought of this. And I'm like, ooh, I thought of this. And so I thought of this. And same thing when I call my mom, I'm like, hey, really fast, what do you think about this idea? Where does your brain go? They're just sharing like, oh, I thought about this. So I thought about this. Like my mom and I caught up about Candace Owens the other day. Because Candace Owens just became Catholic. And I was like, what do you think about it, though? What do you for real think about it, though? And I called her. And then we're like, what do you think about Tammy? We love Tammy. We're sus of Candace, but we love Tammy. You know, Tammy Peterson. And so it's like funny, like hearing my mom know the same internet people I know. And so we'll talk about it. Like I talk YouTube gossip to my mother. It is so funny. Like all the drama on YouTube, I tell my mom about it. I'm like, okay, so there's this guy on the internet, right? And we had this falling out. <laughs> And my mom's like, oh my gosh, like she's just like listening. She has no idea, but she's just like loving the details. She's like, okay, like I just tell my mom, she's so funny, bro. Telling your parents who like, you know, and they're trying their best to understand. It's so funny. In a relationship for one person to sacrifice and another person to like basically have the career of their dreams. And I think it's really hard for two people to have the career of their dreams. Like it's just not going to work. And, and, you know, we, so we made that decision and we stayed in Boston and Kruthi continued to have relatively, I mean, they, she had decent jobs. I think your it wasn't was, like, my joy was not in my job. Yeah. Mm. Right. So you just, my joy wasn't in my job. Let's go girl. Good for you. Knowing things just had to find. Other so as, as a unit, we placed my career ahead of hers and she's still doing that. Right. Cause she's CEO of healthy gamer and this is my dharma and her, she's just helping me out with all the things that I really am bad at. Um, and she really runs the company which was awesome. So I actually went to business school to get a health sector management MBA. What I wanted to do is change the face of healthcare. I wanted to make it better. Like for, I wanted to make it more patient centric. The more you kind of learn about the business of medicine, the yuckier it is. And so that's what I wanted my career to be. And even in healthcare, mental health is like, it's like, I don't know, the redheaded, whatever, like you don't, people don't, people don't care about mental health in the mm. healthcare space. Um, so this is actually exactly what I wanted to be doing. I have to dispute that a little bit. I think, because I remember when you were younger, it was never revolutionized healthcare. Not younger. When I was younger, I wanted like, to work at a cool tech company, but I did that. Yeah. But I mean, I, something tells me that if we had placed your career, if we had given you your choice in, let's say like back in 2008, 2010 and 2014, you would not be in the healthcare space. No, I would be in the media and music space. Absolutely. Which is what you truly love. So I really appreciate that, you know, you found something, a calling within this, but like, I don't ever want to. This is cool because this is healthcare, but this is media. Mm. Yeah, cool. I mean, you made it work, but like, I don't, I, just because you made it work and you found something that you find fulfilling doesn't mean that years ago, you essentially made a sacrifice of your career for my sake. Right. But that's, that's the whole point of this, right? Like I mm -hmm. sacrificed, you sacrificed and here we are and we're better for it. And yeah. I think we never begrudged each other, like the opportunity to do what was best for that person. Do you remember that episode of How I Met Your Mother? This is such a callback to my early 20s where Lily, they focused in on Marshall's job as being a judge, his goal of being a judge. And Lily like left for three months to go figure out if she wanted to be an artist. Like, by the way, my relationship never would have survived something like that. Cause like, why the fuck are you ditching me to go be an artist in San Francisco? But like at the same time, right? Um, that idea is so interesting. Like she's like, I, I wanted to be a painter. You didn't want to be a painter. Okay. Like you need to be, you need to let your partner. That's why when I got with my partner and we were older, to be fair, I asked him like, what are your goals? What are your dreams? What do you do? Cause he, you know, he worked full time. He had his own apartment. He had his own life. He had his own like social group and activities and hobbies. Like he's a full person. Like he's got a whole life. Right. And I said, Hey, you're marrying somebody who's got a very specific thing going on. And I want to build a life together, but I have a direction I'm going in and I'm going for this dream. And either you're going to be with me or not, but I need somebody that like understands the vision because I've dated people before and they didn't get the vision. Now, of course, he sat there. We negotiated. Our first date was eight hours long. We courted for six months, got married after 12. And we were very, very invested in making sure we weren't selling the wrong 
thing to one another. We weren't over promising and that we were on the same page because I never wanted to be the people who in our 60s turned to each other and said, you know, you're the reason I didn't get to do my dream. And like, I don't want to have that conversation because like, no, like we need to make sure neither of us, him nor I are stopping each other's joy. So what is your joy? What is the thing that's your vibe? How do I help you get it? And does it work with our goals? The idea being, instead of changing who we were to fit, it was, are we already compatible? And we were so compatible already that it never felt like a sacrifice to do anything we did. But at the same time, like I said, in I think yesterday's stream, you guys have to remind me, I don't know when I said it, that idea of like, it takes sacrifice. Uh, I'm, I don't know if I ever feel like it's sacrifice so much as like the right thing to do. And if it's the right things to do, then I don't care what I had to do to do it because it was the right decision. So you can turn it into a martyr thing where you're like, I sacrificed. It's like, or you just did the thing that needed to get done. I kind of have the attitude of like, you can call it a sacrifice, legit. Like I'm not judging you, right? I grew up Christian Catholic. I grew up Catholic. So I get it like sacrifice and martyrdom and like you sacrifice. For, I get it. But to me, it's just doing what has to get done. It's not a sacrifice for me to go to work. Work is just what you have to do. So when people are like, this person sacrifices and goes to work every day, I don't know where you're from, but I don't get the luxury of not going to work and being an adult. So that's just what you have to do. So I don't know why you consider it a sacrifice. But some people have that mentality of like, that's that's how they do it, which is fine in their bubble for sure. But I like this like back and forth from them. I like this idea that when they're having a conversation, they're coming at it from such different perspectives. But more than anything, she's just a person with an opinion and he's a professional with an audience who's expecting him to meet them where they're at, which is very interesting. Ken says the right thing to do can be a sacrifice, though, if you think of it as a value na natural thing or neutral, neutral thing. Um, wait, if you think of it as a value neutral thing, the right thing can do to be a sacrifice. What's a sacrifice? What do you guys think that means? Sacrifice. An act of slaughtering an animal or a person surrendering a possession. Okay, maybe not that one. Um, offer to kill, to give up. Okay, sacrifice means to give up. What am I giving up? Like, it's just like what I do to get it done. Like, in order to cut, to get to the weight I wanted to get before I build muscle again, I gave up bread. You can call it a sacrifice. That's just as valuable or reasonable. But I would just say like, yeah, I had to do what I had to do to get where I wanted to go. And if turning it into a sacrifice makes you feel better, you can call it that. I just say like I had to just postpone a moment. I don't know. It just feels like you don't have to, you're not Abraham giving up Isaac to the Lord. Okay. Like it's just, you're giving up bread for a month. Everybody fucking take the chill pill. It just feels a little like I had to sacrifice my son Isaac to the Lord because I'm sacrificing. Like it just feels very like, Bleh. I don't need that much like gold stars for like doing something I want to do anyways. It's like, oh my God, I work so hard so I could go to Disneyland. Okay, like, <laughs> I mean, I guess like, oh, I sacrificed so long so I could buy a house. I mean, yeah, like I had a goal and I saved up money and I bought that house, I guess. Like, I don't know. Call it sacrifice if you want. Ken says give up something important or valued for the sake of other considerations. Yeah, I don't do that. Yeah, I don't do that. I don't think anyone does that. I don't think you give up something important or valued for the sake of other considerations. I don't think anyone does that. Can you give me an example of what that would look like? Because if you have kids, you ha it's not sacrificing, it's doing what's right by your children. If you have a spouse, it's not sacrificing, it's doing what's right by your marriage. So when you say like give up something important or valued for the sake of others' considerations, the quote you shared, what's an example of that that anyone ever does? Because I'm happy to like concede on this. I just don't, I can't think of one that doesn't involve like you do. I think I take a more Randian approach to this. Like I don't believe in altruism. I think everything you do is what you want to do unless you feel definitely coerced or like forced into a situation, obviously minus those, you know, but ultimately like, I don't think you help people other than you want to, you know, Ken says I gave up my career aspirations for other responsibilities. Um, I gave up my career aspirations for other responsibilities. I don't know what that means. I gave up my career aspirations for other responsibilities. Um, like, I don't know what that means, but Dr. Kate gives an example of short-term versus long-term sacrifice and how sometimes teenagers are parentified in uh, families. Like let's say a father dies and then the kid has to stay at home and support the family. The child that often leaves the family and pursues education does better for the family like further in life than the family member who gives up their education to stay home and take care of their parents. 
And so again, are we making sacrifices that are reasonable and playing to our strengths? Then that's just making a good decision. Or are we making sacrifices because we think it's the right thing to do, but it's actually worse for, uh, for us, right? So again, I don't, I don't know exactly the example you're giving, but that's what I, you know, <laughs> I'd say parentified kids have their childhood sacrifice, so to speak. Well, that wasn't their decision, right? Their parents did that to them, which sucks, you know? Ken says, I couldn't afford six years of being poor, so I needed income, so I had to choose a different path. Well, that just sounds like a good decision, right? Doesn't that just sound like a reasonable decision? Does that sound like a sacrifice or is that just like a decision you made because it was you needed money? So you made money. I don't get it. Like, what am I? I'm, I understand, I think, but I don't believe in dreams that way. Like, I don't believe in like if it didn't happen in the lifetime, then it wasn't meant to be type thing. Like it wasn't part of the story for you. So maybe it's just a uh, it's probably a perspective difference where my brain goes, I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do. But at the same time. Like if you know what I mean, I'm not sure. Guess says we sacrifice time with our kids because we have to work to earn money. This is a very difficult subject matter because it's going to be very personal to people. So this is like a philosophy conversation about what is sacrifice and what are you willing to do and what ha what did you even have a choice in doing and how much of your life did you make before you made the decision? Like it's not a sacrifice for me not to have kids. I don't want them. And even if I wanted them and I was sick and I chose not to have them, it wouldn't have been a sacrifice. Right. So I just want to make sure that I'm not insulting anyone. Um, but it's, uh, but I'm having like a very specific, uh, Kay says, I agree with you. Brittany's sacrifice is just doing what you need to do to get the results you value most. LJ says the neurodivergency is strong with this one, bro. I think that's the problem is like, if I come from a certain perspective, I'm going to offend everybody because they're going to feel like I gave this up and like, you don't understand. But in my head, I feel like people give up things because they're coming from a worldview that made them think that was their only decision. So sacrifice. Yeah, Miss Fishy says sacrifice sounds like it's giving up something you don't want to give up. So in my brain, instead of giving up something I don't want to give up, I just don't do that unless I'm forced into an absolute corner, like an absolute corner. Right. But it's not a big deal. Like I'd give it up in a heartbeat. You know what I mean? You're giving up something else to get what you want. Well, that just sounds like a great decision. I don't know. Jimothy says, I don't know why, but I'm so interestingly triggered by this. Bro, this is a very sensitive subject for people. And I've already fucking, I know philosophy is hard. I know values are hard. I know inner working things are hard because your trauma comes up. So I'm trying to be very careful here too. Because I know, I know I'm hard to digest, but also you have to understand I've already gone through all of these things myself. I've already had to have those conversations about like, am I willing to sacrifice my homosexuality for my parents? Am I willing to sacrifice my time with them? Am I willing to give up everything? And then I realized, fuck all of you. I love you so much. You are not the one living my life. And you're certainly not going to be the one who's dead with me when I have to die and think about the regret in my life. So I'm going to live the life I want, okay? But obviously getting there comes from a very specific place of balancing the internal with the external, Right. So guess says, yeah, but you have to work to earn money, but I'd prefer to spend time with my kids. Don't. OK, you can also live without outside of reality. If you're going to have kids, you have to provide for them. If you want to spend time with your kids and not have to work, don't have kids or find a partner who can do the working while you stay home. But realistically, nobody gets to live life where you don't work and have a good life. You cannot provide a good life for yourself and not work. And work might not bring in money, but there's still work involved. So if you want to spend the most time with your kids possible, but you don't want to have to earn an income, then you have to find a way to have that income without working, right? So again, it's like for my brain, like people have to work, but also maybe pick and choose when you work or how you work or with who you work, right? So I think that's the dilemma too is, mm, mm, you know, I don't know if people are realistic sometimes with how life itself works first and foremost, you're right. And then on top of that, you have to make a decision. Chrissy says, so so you see you moving to Croatia as a sacrifice, like you moving away from your family as a sacrifice from the relationship you both wanted. No, I do not. I do you. Sorry. Do you see? No, Croatia was not a sacrifice. I love being here. I hope they let me stay forever. I love Croatia. I'm so happy to be here. This was not a sacrifice. Uh, I made no like I do not. No, I consider this a blessing. I consider myself so lucky. I feel like I I have a dream life. I feel like my life is perfect. I have everything I want in it. And by perfect, I mean vibing, bros. I mean vibing, okay? Nothing's perfect. 
but my life is no, like my life in Croatia is the last thing from a sacrifice, right? Lexi says, do you think uh, it's a sacrifice if someone gives your their life like on a life for someone else in an extreme situation? That's what I'm pondering. And I'm curious what you think. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. That's an interesting idea. Man, this is good. We've talked about this before. You know, if I sacrifice my life for somebody in that sense, like I took a bullet for you, bro, relax. Okay, just get over it. It's not a big deal. It was part of my values. Don't be, a, okay, it's not even about you. I'm gonna be real with you. If I saved my nephews from dying, it's not even about them. I mean, I love them, but it's about me. I'm not gonna let some kid die, bro, when I'm the adult in this situation, bro. Like, at the end of the day, I do take a pretty Randian approach to this where I don't even believe in altruism. So I think if you like take a bullet for somebody, that's just you living within your values. Like I help people because it's within my values. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't look at me like a hero. I don't want your praise. Like, okay, just take note. I will be annoyed with all of you from the afterlife if you make a statue of me. If like this lady saved a kid, don't fucking, okay, who cares, bro? You are gonna give me a gold star for doing the right thing? No. Okay, please. it's gross. But also, I get it. People want to hype people up. It's like amazing. I love watching people be heroes, all that stuff. But for Brittany's perspective, my particular brain, I just, it wasn't a sacrifice for me to take a bullet for someone or like to protect my nephews or like to think about my nieces or to think like I'm just doing what's right. It just doesn't make sense to me to think of it. But I could see why other people feel that way. You know, I just don't, I don't know. Like, what are you gonna do? Like, I just think people do things because it makes sense to them which is beautiful and what you should do, you know? Gracie says, sacrifice something you want for something you want more or sacrifice something you want for something you need, which always ends up being a benefit to you. You know, that's how I feel about it, you know? Uh, Hannah says, sometimes a sacrifice is not a big deal for me, but sometimes it's hard and causes and causes me to make a big effort. Just depends. Yeah, I also think like it depends. Um, I think it also depends on where you are in your life and the relationship you're having with yourself. Obviously, I felt like I was sacrificing a lot more in my early 20s uh, than I am now because I was. Like I was sacrificing who I was to make people less mad at me, which is obviously why I don't do it now because it didn't end up helping me any. It didn't help me staying closeted. It didn't help me staying and pretending I wasn't like a liberal or a progressive. Like it didn't help me to lie to people about being gay. It never helped me. You know, it was what I thought I needed to do and it helped me survive, but it just didn't help me in the long run. So for me, sacrificing who I am for other people just never made sense to me in the long run. But obviously I also have my values. So sacrificing my values also never seems worth it. You know what I mean? For what? You know? Croatia hype. Let's go, Lakara. Are you learning any Croatian and is it a hard language? It is a hard language. Thank you for asking. And barely. I'm trying, but I'm very bad with languages. <sighs> Jack, you know, I, I hear comments like this a lot. And again, you're coming to a channel. Okay, let me read the comments. It says, isn't it bad to tell people they shouldn't date or date someone if they or them have issues with self-worth because that's such a huge swath of people? First, it's not having an issue with self-worth. It's having low or no self-worth, okay? Two, that's such a huge swath of people. Um, I don't care how many people it is because I'm focused on the individual. Like, guys, if you watch my channel because you're hoping to get advice for the general public, you're in the wrong place. If you want to be like everybody else, go watch everybody else, right? If you want to do something, because if you look at the world and you see how unhappy it is, you see they're suffering from a loneliness like epidemic, you see the world being angry and bitter, and you expect me to be another YouTuber who's going to reinforce that belief in you, no. You can watch somebody else, right, girl? Like, I'm not here to care about everybody else who's so miserable. I'm ready to help people who don't want to be miserable. And that starts by working on the relationship you have with yourself. Nobody wants to come home to a negative Nancy, but especially you, you have such low self-worth, you don't even like yourself. And then you expect other people to like you? How, how rude is that? How incredibly hilarious is that? You don't even like yourself and you want other people to like you? Now, at the same time, why don't you like yourself? Is that a mistake? 
Are you misunderstanding yourself? Why in the world don't you like yourself? What is so horrible about you? Sometimes when I ask people that question, like, what is so horrible about you, bro? They're like, I stay at home and play video games all day. And I'm like, I like video games. I mostly like Smash Bros, but okay, so that can't be the reason. What else? Well, I, I don't know. I just, I don't want to talk to people. Okay, so what else? Like, you're not out here stabbing babies to death. What is wrong with you? You're not out here genociding a whole country. That's Israel. <laughs> Damn, I should not joke. That's a joke. Well, is it a joke? That's a joke. Is it a joke? I shouldn't joke. Fuck. The point is, is that all the people who get down on themselves so hard are literally sitting there thinking they're horrible people when all you're doing at most is sitting at home and doing nothing. At least you're sitting at home and not doing anything. I'd rather you do that than go out in public and do something that hurts people. So the only one you're hurting is yourself. Let's talk about why you're hurting yourself. You know what I mean? JJ says, I think you're taking the word sacrifice more grandiose, like the biblical, then that's how it's more commonly used in smaller scale, but some same principle. Yeah, I am thinking of sacrifice as like <laughs> the bigger thing. Stop. Oh my God, I'm making myself laugh over here. Uh, girl, 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 girl. Maiden says sacrifice implies an attachment to the thing sacrificed. Ah, uh, that's true too. Keep in mind at the place I am now, my whole goal is to like not hold attachment, you know, not to have the attachment, you know, like if my whole house burns down in a fire, that's sad, bro. It's just a house. When we're all having relationships with things, we learn in different ways to let go of the idea that we had control over something in the first place. Like I told my, I was telling my, I was telling my husband earlier that I, when I was younger, I had so much hate in my heart for like people who had done me wrong. Like my stalker, I used to reference my stalker as like that dumb bitch every time I thought about her. And now I'm like, oh, you know, mental health's a thing. We all have mental health issues. And when I radically noticed a change in myself, I went from a person that was like that dumb bitch to, eh, what are you going to do? Mental health is real, right? Mental health is real. People are suffering. And nobody is a stalker unless they are genuinely fucked up. So who am I to look at someone so fucked up and think, what a dumb bitch? At the end of the day, she's not even a dumb bitch. She's a sick person. And when I realized I'd let go of that hate in my heart years ago and I changed as a person, it showed even my sister was like, oh my God, you usually say her name and then call her a dumb bitch, but like, look how much you've changed. I was like, I know. I just one day decided like, why would I hold on to this attachment of hating a sick person? What am I doing to myself or to her? Like, she's a sick person. And how can I ask the world to be kind when I can't even be kind to a sick person? So with peace and love, I wish her the best. But she's a deeply sick person. And I can't hold any hate in my heart for her because I really don't have, I don't even understand the law. I can't even logic myself into hating people. I've lost it. I used to be so bitter. And then years ago, it just went away. Like, what am I doing? But it didn't just go away. I meditated. I read books. I really thought about the kind of person that I wanted to be. What are my values? And I couldn't imagine hating a sick person. And I thought to myself, then why am I doing it? Because in our heads, we think, oh, they're doing this. They, they're, they know they're sick. They're doing this on purpose. I really don't think they're doing it on purpose anymore than they're doing it because they think it's right. So I'm not angry at you, but I'm also going to put down my boundaries and I'm definitely going to defend myself. I'm not angry at you. I don't hate you, but that doesn't mean I'm weak either. And that's the key here. Just because I don't hate you doesn't mean I don't know how to defend myself, girl. Okay, don't get it. Don't get it mistaken. Don't get it. Mm -mm. Don't get confused. LJ say it's like getting angry at someone in a coma for their inability to wake up. Exactly. And what are you really frustrated with? Yourself for not accepting the fact that they're in a coma. That's why I say like this attachment we have to people reacting a certain way or being a certain way. That's an us problem. It has nothing to do with them. My parents who are still hoping that I become Catholic. My parents who still love a version of me that exists and doesn't at the same time. I saw this really great TikTok from this woman who was saying, 
Do y'all come from one of those families that refuses to acknowledge you're in your 30s and they still treat you like you're still 13? A lot of people freeze frame the version of you in their head and they refuse to believe you've changed or grown up. And as somebody who's the ripe young age of 35, I'm still growing. You know, I'm not grown, grown yet. I'm not an adult. You know, I'm not old yet, but I'm old enough where when I look at a 20 year old, I think, man, that's a kid, bro. That's a kid. And then when I think of myself, I think, man, I'm just a kid. I'm just a 35 year old teenager. Okay. And then at the same time, you almost have to be so grateful for all the versions of yourself that you've been. And then so excited for the version of yourself you're going to be when you're older. I can't wait to meet me in my 60s. How great is she going to be, bro? Conrad says, I think they're doing it on purpose, but they aren't considering you. I think the hard part is realizing that it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. Yeah, I think there's some category of person that obviously they are doing it on purpose, but it doesn't even have to do with you. That fucking sucks. But also, eh, hey, it's not even personal, you know? Villainy says, I'm internally 15 to my mom, even though I'm 28. My parents sometimes will be like, I loved you when you were 10. You were so smart when you were 10. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm 35. Fuck, that's so funny. And they're like, you were so Catholic then. And I'm like, mm hmm. And my parents celebrate my wins. They're like very happy for me and everything, but they're still hoping one day I'll be Catholic. That's so sweet. But at the same time, like, and then I just have to sit there and be like, mm-hmm, yeah, not everybody can see you and not everybody's going to see the way you've grown. But the point is, do you see you? When we're talking about like low self-esteem or, or, you know, when we're talking about low self-worth, that comes from you. That really is about the relationship you're having with you, but absolutely is impacted by how you were raised and what feedback you got growing up and how people supported you, right? Absolutely. Nocturnal Wolf says at 35, you are grown. I mean, it's subjective, right? I love Dr. Kirk Honda because he's in his 50s. He'll be like, oh, people in their 30s are just kids to me. And I'm like, absolutely. Nocturnal Wolf says I'm 35 and it'll be 36 in September. And if I'm not grown now, then that's nuts. Well, I think it's subjective. I know I'm an adult and I know I pay my own bills, but I'm not grown in the way that I see grown in the same way that I don't think I'm wise. Like when people are like, oh, Brittany, you're a wise person. I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. I think we're talking about different things. When I say grown, I mean my parents are grown, grown. My parents are like adults. They like adult, you know? Like they're real adults. I'm just like an adult, you know? I'm like an adult and you can't tell me what to do, but I'm not grown in the same way. In the same way, like Uncle Iroh and Cora is wise. Um, I'm not that. Do you think I'm Uncle Iroh and Cora? No, girl. Uncle Iroh emoji in the chat, guys? Like, no, obviously not. But I, you know, and I probably won't, I'll probably die unwise. But from someone's perspective, sure. Oh, you're so wise. Well, am I wise or am I 35 and you're 20? Am I wise or are we in different stages of life? Am I wise or are you 60 and you're just figuring out some things? You know what I mean? Like, are we wise? You know? Laura says, interestingly, though, many of your values seem derived from a Catholic upbringing your parents gave you. So hopefully they see that even if the parts of you they will never accept. Oh, I tell them that all the time. I was like, I'm really lucky you raised me Catholic and I read philosophy at a young age. Obviously, right? I hope they see it, too. I think they do. But sometimes they say things like you'd never get an abortion, right? And I'm like, oh, well, you know. I'd probably never get an abortion, but if it's like an ectopic pregnancy, like a definitely getting an abortion and they're just like, <gasps> like you can see them be like, oh my God, it's so interesting. Alex says, I think when you're open mind, when you're open minded to grow and learn growth and learning, you're, you're always looking up at older, of, oh my God, Brittany, Alex says, <laughs> when I think, I think when you're open minded to growth and learning, you're always looking up. Uh, look up at those older than you and being humbled. Yes, exactly. It's hard not to look at people who have done something that you're looking at. You're like, how do I do that? And you know you haven't done it yet. I know I haven't arrived. Like I know I'm still figuring it out, right? Absolutely. 65 is an elder. 65, I think, is an elder, right? Well, actually, I think I would argue 70 is an elder, like a true elder. 670 to 100 is like the elders, I feel like 65, you you know, you're like an adult adult. But I, I feel like 70, man, to me is like, okay, 
Those are elders. Maiden says, train up a child in a way he should go and he'll never depart from it. When it comes to the big values, that is true, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think so too. Okay, with that said, that's what I wanted to talk about in relation to Dr. K. So interesting back and forth between the two. I was excited when someone told me about it. I figured it wouldn't be a big deal and it wasn't. If anything, it was a good display of communication and how tension can arise. And also keep in mind, they had a whole bunch of people watching them. You know what I mean? So good video and I'm glad that we watched it. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 